This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. President-elect Joe Biden's formally nominated Judge Merrick Garland for attorney general. Garland's a centrist judge, who was President Obama's pick to serve on the Supreme Court after the death of Antonin Scalia in 2016. But his nomination stalled after Republican senators, led by Mitch McConnell, refused to put it up for a vote. Garland served on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals for over two decades, previously worked at the Justice Department, where he prosecuted the Oklahoma City bombing case. On Thursday, Merrick Garland cited the insurrection at the Capitol as he talked about the rule of law. As everyone who watched yesterday's events in Washington now understands, if they did not understand before, the rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike, that there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for friends, another for foes, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich, and another for the poor, or different rules, depending upon one's race or ethnicity. Biden's other picks for top posts at the Justice Department include Vanita Gupta to be associate attorney general, currently head of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Now is the time to ensure that our economic system works for everyone, that we can protect the health and safety of all of the American people, and that we will harness all of the Justice Department's levers for civil rights, justice and police reform and climate justice and so much more. And Joe Biden has nominated Kristen Clark, the head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, to be Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. I stand here today deeply inspired by the example of the late Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, and other public servants who dedicated their lives to advancing the cause of justice. We are at a crossroads. I am if I am fortunate enough to be confirmed, we will turn the page on hate and close the door on discrimination by enforcing our federal civil rights laws. To talk more about President-elect Joe Biden's picks to run the Justice Department, we're joined by Ellie Mistal, the nation's justice correspondent, author of the magazine's monthly column, Objection. I mean, what an unusual day, Ellie. You have um, this aftermath of the insurrection on Wednesday, um, and as the death toll grew to five, um, pre you have Joe Biden coming out and announcing who would be the attorney general and the other picks for the Justice Department. Um, again, you were tweeting up a storm about both. Can you respond to his choices and also what happened in the nation's capital? for attorney general was going to be his most consequential uh, cabinet pick before the president of the United States appears to have launched a failed coup against his own government, right? Merrick Garland's pick was huge before um, the events of this week. Uh, I'm a little bit underwhelmed by the Garland pick. People need to remember that Garland was picked for the Supreme Court because he was a compromise candidate. He was picked to entice Republican votes to confirm him. Now, people have forgotten why he was a centrist and why he was a compromise candidate, because the Republicans martyred him, you know, uh, um, over the Scalian uh, replacement. Um, and so he's gotten this kind of, like, cult status. But this is a centrist jurist who has a history, a troubling history to me, of being deferential to police and being unwilling to hold police accountable for acts of brutality and misconduct. Now, people change, right? I, I, I'm basing my information on his actual written opinions from his long career, but that career, that was before Trump, right? That was before uh, um, the events of this week, even. So Merrick Garland's going to have a, a, an opportunity to prove, to prove me wrong um, and to prove that he's learned and evolved, because to, to link it up with what we've seen this week, by the time Merrick Garland uh, takes control of the Justice Department, 
many of the domestic terrorists that we saw this week will have not been brought to justice, right? Very few of them will have been arrested. Very few of them will have been charged. Merrick Garland will have an opportunity, will have a target-rich environment to show that he is willing to put the rule of law and to take these people on head-on and seriously, right? We, he will not have charged, uh, we will not have charged Don Trump Jr. for incitement to a riot as he did in that speech when he stood there for two minutes and yelled, fight for Trump, fight for Trump, fight for Trump, right before they stormed the Capitol. Don Trump Jr. will not have been charged by the time Merrick Garland takes control, all right? Rudy Giuliani, who instructed these people to go out and have a trial by combat, will not have been charged by the time Merrick Garland get, takes control. So if he wants to prove that he, is, that he is ready to apply the rule of law equally, he will have multiple opportunities to do so as of January 20th. So talk about the other members of the team and how much power they have. We just interviewed um, uh, the now head, uh, if she is approved, uh, the head of the Civil Rights Division, who Joe Biden uh, had nominated, uh, not to mention—that's Kristen Clark—not to mention um, Vanita Gupta will post both of those interviews um, recently. Their significance, and will these even departments be revived? Talk about what's happened to them. It's a great team, um, I think, writ large. Um, Kristen Clark is is one of the best. Um, I think she will be great at the Civil Rights D Division. Vanita Gupta, I mean, look, it, 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 it all else being equal, Vanita Gupta is on my personal shortlist for the Supreme Court. Like, I think she is that um, kind of serious um, and important person. Um, so I couldn't, I, I, I'm very happy with the team. When you talk about the kind of power they have, that's going to have a lot to do with Garland himself. I, I, I the fact that they were all announced together, which doesn't always happen, suggests that that he that that department will work um, hand in hand, uh, hand in glove, perhaps is, is a better uh, analogy for that. Um, so, so I have hope that they will have real power, real authority to, and I think you put it exactly right, restore divisions of the Justice Department that have atrophied or, in some cases, willingly been dismantled by Bill Barr and Jeff Sessions. Um, take the Civil Rights Division, uh, for instance. One of the one of the main ways the federal government has for imposing uh, uh, standards on local police is through the use of something called consent decrees. The Justice Department investigates you to avoid federal charges. Your jurisdiction, your police department, enters in a consent decree with the Justice Department to meet certain standards in terms of uh, you know good policing um, I ideals. Um, Jeff Sessions famously ended the use of consent decrees within his first couple of weeks in office. Uh, uh, let, I would assume that Kristen Clark will restore the use of consent decrees within her first hundred hours in office, right? So, so, so the atrophying and the will, I said, the willful dismantling of some of the structures of the Justice Department, um, I, I do have hope will be restored under this team. But again, the, the issue here is not, re restoration is great. I, I, it, it's important to, to bring the Justice Department um, to wash clean the stains of Bill Barr and Jeff Sessions from the Justice Department. That's all well and good. But this moment demands more than mere restoration. This, this moment demands a Justice Department who is willing to go after the people who threaten our democracy and who openly threaten um, the safety of black people in this country. And Merrick Garland will have an opportunity to prove that he is willing to do that. And then you have the speculation that if, he, in fact, he is approved by the Senate, now a Democratic Senate, um, you'll have his open seat on the federal bench, the possibility that um, Judge Katenji Brown Jackson will fill that seat and then possibly be nominated to the Supreme Court if there is an opening. Yeah, so here's the thing about the D.C. Circuit. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but the D.C. Circuit, is, uh, which is where Garland currently sits, um, is basically like the feeder circuit for the Supreme Court. A lot of Supreme Court justices kind of got their start on the D.C. Circuit, currently on the Supreme Court. John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, and Brett Kavanaugh all came from the D.C. Circuit. Ruth Bader Ginsburg came from the D.C. Circuit. It's a, it's a theater, you know, it's, it's the Alabama to the NFL, right? Well, the D.C. Circuit is, is not nothing.
Yeah. So 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 yes, putting um, uh, Judge Jackson on this, the D.C. Circuit is not only great for Judge Jackson; she's a great judge, and and, and great for 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 the D.C. Circuit. Uh, it's it's a it's a suggestion that you are being groomed um, to fill a seat on the Supreme Court should an opening come up. So that's great. That's important. I'll, I'll point out that Garland, that people making this big, like, oh, and so see, there's three-dimensional chess for... Judge Garland was old enough that he could have taken senior status and thus opened up the seat on the D.C. Circuit anyway. So so, so our, the, the argument that, like, the really good thing about putting making Garland AG is that he's opened up this that doesn't really hold up so all right like it's great that Biden will have the opportunity um to put another justice on a judge on the DC circuit uh um that's that's awesome that didn't have to be this way Biden wanted it to be this way didn't have to be this way Ellie just before we go we just have 30 seconds from the Washington Post today time will tell whether the takeover of Capitol was a riot a last gasp of a renegade president or an early skirmish in a civil war and your new piece for the nation is headlined the confederacy the confederacy finally stormed the capitol um, the significance saw... of this week what we saw this week was, uh, Frederick Douglass said, power never concedes anything without a demand. And what we saw this week was power not conceding, all right? White supremacists have never conceded defeat, not once, not ever in the history of this country. And we have to always be ready to fight them. Because when we are not ready, when we are not prepared, this is what happens.